Well, let's bow our heads and let's get started on this incredible book, the first chapter, and uh, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we, as we open up this book, Lord, we just pray that every intent you have for it, for each and every individual here in person, watch it online, maybe sometime in the future watch, and we just pray that your will for this book be done in each of our lives, Lord, the way that you intend. We pray that you would use this book, Lord, to help us to see you as our, our God, our Savior, our great King, Lord, and that our believing loyalty to you would increase for your great glory. So, Lord, be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. First Timothy. So first, obviously we're doing first and second Timothy as we cruise through this. And <laughs> this, this is one of the key books for setting up church leadership. Paul is very, very concerned with leaving these churches that he's planted, not only into good hands, but also with um, good doctrine, right? So we've got to leave the church with good people, with good doctrine. <clears throat> and this is a very, very key book uh, that God has left us for doing just that. This was likely written after Paul's Roman imprisonment that you see at the end of the book of Acts. It's written from Macedonia. It seems, according to uh, Acts 20, that after Paul left Rome, he went to Ephesus only to discover that they have received many false teachings while he was gone. And he predicted that in Acts chapter 20, where he said <clears throat> this, and this also seems to be, First uh, Timothy seems to be like a fulfillment of this prediction in Acts 20, as we see what he deals with there. Acts 20, verses 29 and 30, Paul says, for I know this, that after my departure, this is, he's talking to the Ephesians, <clears throat> the Ephesians elders. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. So he says, I know this is going to happen to you. And now he has... Timothy, that he's writing to, who is the elder at the church in Ephesus. He's the guy that Paul left in charge. So, <clears throat> the center of the book, and the reason why I bring up the center of the book, and I see a lot of my students out there, they know the center of books or stories are very significant. It's usually where the main point of stories happen in Bible writings, we're very trained to look to the end of the story to find the impact. Very often the impact is in the middle of a story. The middle of this book is chapter 3. And it's chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And so this is going to kind of serve as the main reason Paul's writing this letter. He says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. I want you to think about that for a moment. <clears throat> he says, there's a way we ought to conduct ourselves, correct? In the house of God. And then this is how he describes the house of God. It's the pillar, so think of these pillars that support roofs and so forth. It's pillar, and it's the ground of truth. Okay, so it's where truth is grounded, and it's the pillars of truth. So in other words, you'll see society crumble when they look elsewhere for their truths, correct? You'll see society crumble when they look elsewhere besides the church for their truths. Where are you getting your truths from? Where are you coming up with how you see life in the world and human life and who we are as, as beings, as sexual beings, as, as social beings? How do you decide the truth of all of those things? Well, the Apostle Paul's suggestion here is God 
The church is the church of the living God, and it's the pillar and it's the ground of the truth, of which Jesus says he is that thing, right? That truth. He is the truth. Okay? So that's what church ought to be. And it's very important each and every church, just like Paul is stressing to Timothy about having the purity of doctrine and the quality of the leadership. Those are the two things he's really going to harp on. You have to be in sound doctrine. That's why we call it orthodoxy. Okay, Ortho meaning the same or straight. It actually means straight. Like an orthodontist, what are they going to do with your teeth? Make them straight, right? Um, so orthodoxy is, is straight teaching. It's, the church has got to be about straight teaching, not any of its side views or anything like that. And <clears throat> that's opposed to heterodoxy. Heterodoxy is when everybody's got their own opinion and they're just running with their own opinions and, and all of that. Paul is saying there's, there's truth and that's what the church is responsible for teaching. And so doctrine has got to be made solid. That's why we have creeds in our faith to say if you go outside of these creeds, you're into heterodoxy, right? If you stay within the creeds, you're in orthodoxy. All right, so Paul's great concern for that. <clears throat> so as we go through these chapters over the next month or so, this is so foundational for church, and church has gone so off path that you may get surprised by some things over the next month or so. Okay, you might lift your eyebrow a little bit and go, really? And you might have to decide if you're offended or not sometimes, okay? So <clears throat> um, that should be fun, right? Okay, all right, so look forward to that. All right, so let's get into the text. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. Now... First of all, isn't it interesting that Paul says he's an apostle by the commandment of God? Think about his Damascus Road experience. There was no interview to see if God wanted to hire him and Paul wanted to work for him, right? In fact, Paul tells us that part of the speech, got, that, Je part of the speech that Jesus gave to Paul on the road to Damascus was this. Imagine this being your job interview and your potential future boss said this, I will show you how much you must suffer for my namesake. And some reason Paul says, I am all in. Can you imagine? Paul says, I'm compelled by the love of Christ. Somehow he's so compelled by Christ's love there that he can actually hear Christ say, I will show you how much you must suffer for my namesake. And boy, did Paul suffer. You ever see the list of his suffering? And, and that was before he got beheaded and ended in beheading. So, <clears throat> so here we see a couple of neat things in this first verse. He's an apostle by the commandment of God. And it says, God, our Savior. That's not usually the term you hear for the Father, is it? And we know it's for the Father because after that it says, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. <clears throat> so unusually... Savior is reserved as a descriptor of Jesus Christ. Here, Savior is used of the Father. But that would not have shocked Paul's audience, or at least not his Jewish audience, because we see the role of Savior or the term Savior used of the Father in 1 Chronicles 16.35, in Psalm 24.5, in Psalm 65, 5, in Psalm 85, 4, Isaiah 43, 3, and 11, Isaiah 62, 11, Isaiah 63, 8, Hosea 13, 4, Micah 7, 7, Habakkuk 3, 18. It's pretty much spread throughout the Bible. God, our Savior. And then it says, in the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Now, what does the Bible mean by hope? Okay, it's not the type of hope you experience as Dolphin fans that very often gets disappointed by 4 o'clock every Sunday afternoon, right? This is a hope that does not disappoint, correct? It's simply stuff that you can't have now, like heaven. But it's guaranteed 
if you continue in the faith. It's guaranteed to you. So you wait for it in, in hope, in biblical hope. <clears throat> to Timothy, a true son in the faith. And I find that a marvelous title for Timothy. A true son in the faith. Because we know Timothy was brought up by his Jewish mother and his Gentile father. And because he had a Gentile father, he did not get circumcised, right? So <clears throat> Paul seems to adopt him as his spiritual son. We don't believe Paul had any children. So he takes Timothy as a spiritual son, which shows us the incredible impact that we can have with our youth, correct? Okay, we credible impact we can have with our youth, just no matter what their home situation is. Okay, I'm not saying Timothy had a bad one. I'm just saying it's really cool that as busy as Paul was, he's able to look at Timothy and call him his true son in the faith. <clears throat> now, although this letter is written personally to Timothy, it appears to be intended for a larger audience base uh, b because of Paul's formality of his titles that he gives himself. If he's just writing, thinking only Timothy will read this, it's not likely he would describe himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. If you're writing to one person, you just say, hey, it's Paul. All right? So it's probably, it's written to Timothy, but probably intended for a larger audience. <clears throat> Now, the book of Acts tells us that Timothy came from Lystra, which is a city in the province of Galatia. We see that in Acts 16. He was the son of a Greek father, Acts 16.2, and a Jewish mother named Eunice, we see in 2 Timothy 1.5. His mother and grandmother taught him the scriptures from the time of Timothy's youth. We see that in 2 Timothy 1.5 and 3.15. Now, Timothy, you'll see when Jesus Christ is speaking to this Ephesian church in the book of Revelation, when he's speaking to the churches in Revelation and he addresses this church, this Ephesian church, <clears throat> we see in chapter 2, verse 4 of Revelation, Jesus says this to that Ephesian church, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, that's in Revelation, right? Well, we're not at the time of Revelation. Now, we're at the time of the beginning of the Ephesian church. So they had a first love that they left, right? So how did they get this first love? Well, the best answer is Timothy. Timothy is the one that developed this love in them that created the Ephesian church that unfortunately they in some manner walked away from. But Timothy would be the guy in charge that it seems to me his legacy would be he's the one that gave them a re reputation of having, as Jesus Christ, their very first love. Verse 3. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And again, the word there for no other doctrine is that you don't teach, <coughs> is that they teach no heterodoxy. That's the word there. It's don't, you can't teach just whatever teachings you want to teach. <clears throat> that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. Now, obviously in our social media world, there's a lot of good and healthy discussions on Scripture and there's a lot of things that Paul say, says here, people giving heed to fables or to endless genealogies, right? Like what tr in their day be what tribe are you from and, you know, who are your, who was your ancestry and all these things. <clears throat> but he says, here's your, here's your plumb line for deciding, are you engaging in proper interactions on social media when you're talking about God? Well, are you causing disputes or are you, is it resulting in godly edification, which is in our faith? Okay? Is it just causing disputes or is there godly edification that's happening through your interaction? So here, Paul says, do not give heed 
to these things which cause disputes. Now, if you're saying, hey, you're saved by grace through faith alone, and they're saying, no, you're not, it's this and that, then that's something worth going back and forth on, correct? Because if you win, that's very godly edification because that's a salvation issue, right? Okay, but he's talking about fables, endless genealogies, things that really, when the dust settles, didn't matter much. Okay, but yet, but yet a dispute was caused, feelings were hurt, and very likely people now start criticizing Christians or the church or whatever. Okay, <clears throat> so it takes some wisdom to discern all of that. Now, now he's, he's encouraging Timothy to remain there in Ephesus. And what reasons does he give him to remain in Ephesus? Don't leave Ephesus, stay in this church because remember, <clears throat> um, well, it's going to say in, in verses 3 through 7, you stay because they need the truth. In verses 8 through 11, he's going to say you stay because just because a place is hard to minister in doesn't mean you don't minister there. In verses 12 through 16, he's going to say you stay because God uses anybody for his purposes. And you'll see that when we get there. You stay because you serve a great God, and that's always a reason to stay ministering when you don't feel like ministering anymore. You stay because you're in a battle, and you cannot surrender these battles because the one that went before us already won the war. You stay because there remain hard things for you to do, and doctrine is so important that we must assure always that it's taught correctly. You'll see that in verses 19 and 20. And Paul says it more emphatically in Galatians 1.8, where he says, even if an angel from heaven gives you a gospel different from the gospel that I'm giving you, you're to tell him he's eternally damned. <clears throat> now, some of the Gnostic teachings of the day emphasized endless genealogies <clears throat> as emanations from God Ancient Jewish writings used to include complex genealogies about spiritual mysteries. And this talk only served to divide people, not to edify people. So Paul's trying to get rid of that issue uh, right here and now. All right. <clears throat> Verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. So why am I telling you not to put up with false doctrine? Because the goal is to have love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. I want you to just notice, start noticing in your Bible how many things come in sets of three. I call it the fingerprints of the triune God, right? It's like the fingerprints of the triune God. So here he says, uh, you're to, the purpose of the commandment is love where? From, your, from a pure heart from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Now, he just gave these, this trinity of virtues, okay, your purity of heart, your good conscience, your sincere faith, <clears throat> these trinity of virtues, and then he said, some have strayed from that, and their talk became what? Idle, right? It's not moving anybody forward. It's like your car when it's in neutral, okay? It's not going to get you anywhere, right? It's idle talk. <clears throat> now, um, And it says they're, they're desiring to be teachers. Now, certainly in ancient Israel, to be a teacher of the law was considered to be an extremely high honor. Uh, you, that became a problem as Jesus addressed the Pharisees because they loved to wear the long robes, they loved to be called rabbi in the public square, and they loved the attention, right? It was extremely high honor for them to be a teacher of the law. So Paul is saying, listen, some are doing this just to be that teacher of the law, getting these high honors and things like that, but they don't understand what they say, nor do they understand the things which they're affirming. In other words, that's the definition of idle talk, right? You just literally, 
say things for the sake, sake of saying things, but then, see, that's why I like, well, I shouldn't say that, actually. And now you're wondering. But I was going to say, that's why we do Q&A, is because I want to be held accountable for what I say, quite frankly. Okay? I want to be held accountable for what I say. And I only want to say what I think the authors are saying. Okay? Because I love to be able to always fall back to this. Okay? I didn't write this stuff. I'm just doing a book report. Right? Okay? <laughs> so a lot of times... A lot of times your issues with God, not with the preacher, <laughs> if the preacher's preaching the truth, okay? If he's not preaching the truth, then you have an issue with the preacher. And you might want to keep that in mind next week when you come, by the way, <laughs> okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> verse 8, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. I love how he just throws it in there. Okay, The law is not for kidnappers, murderers, you killed your mom, your dad, and anything else that is not good doctrine. Same category, isn't that incredible? Now, <clears throat> a lot to say here. First of all, one of the purposes of the law is to show us our sin. It's not intended to lead us to righteousness. It can't do that. It's to point out literally that you can't follow it for your righteousness. It's like Paul would say, I didn't know I was a coveter until I read the law and it said, do not covet. And then he said, and that law killed me because of the wages of sin is what? Death. Okay. Now, only Jesus can lead you to righteousness. The law cannot do that. And a great picture of that you see when you look at Moses' wilderness wanderings with the people of Israel, Moses gets the law from God on Mount Sinai, correct? He gets the law from God on Mount Sinai. Then as the lawgiver of Israel, he leads them through the wilderness for 40 years. Then when he finally gets to the foot of the Jordan River, which now all he has to do after 40 years is cross that river and he's in the promised land that was intended for him 40 years earlier. But God says, no, you have to go up on this mountain and die. You're not to cross over. And it's like, what in the world, God? How frustrating would that be? Instead, he has that responsibility turned over to Joshua. And Joshua will actually lead them into the promised land. You ever see a football player like catch a kickoff on his own goal line and he runs 99 yards to the one and gets tackled? And then the running back comes in and they give him the ball and he goes one yard and it's a touchdown and everybody's jumping all over him. With well, the guy that just ran 99 yards is like, yeah, it's like, great, you were awesome, man. Good, good one yard run, right? I think that's how Moses had to feel, <coughs> right? 40 years in the wilderness, gets him right to the foot of the Jordan. And God says, stop right there. It's time for you to go up on the mountain and die. And then Joshua gets the ball and crosses the goal line, right? Well, why? Well, this says the law cannot lead you to righteousness. Moses is the lawgiver. If God allows Moses to cross that Jordan and go into the promised land, which is analogous to heaven for us, our promised land, right? So if the lawgiver is allowed to take you into the promised land, then that's going to teach us that following the law can lead us to righteousness, can lead us to heaven. But God said that's not going to be the case. You're going to need a Joshua, which, by the way, Joshua is the English translation of the Hebrew name Yeshua, which is the Greek translation, Jesus. It's going to take Jesus to get you into the promised land. Okay? Isn't it just an amazing coincidence that all that fell into place like that? It's like ridiculously lucky, right? Okay. That was sarcastic, by the way. All right. <clears throat> now, 
It said, Paul says here something that I thought was interesting. He says, the law is not made for a righteous person. I never heard the term making the law, that the law was made. You always hear that it's given, right? The law was given. Here he said the law was not made. So I looked that up, and it turns out that it's possible, Paul was thinking of this, that they used to hang the law up in public areas if people were violating a certain law, they would make a wooden board. They would make the law out of wood and hang it in a public display to say, hey, follow this law. Okay, so you might be thinking of that. The law was made, <coughs> was not made for a righteous person, but for all these sinners. Now, obviously, the law is not made for a righteous person because where we don't get our righteousness from the law. Where do we get our righteousness from? the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? He had to do all of that perfectly and then be willing to give that over to us through faith. Through faith, you know, I know you've been taught a thousand times Jesus died for you, and that's totally true. Your sin was imputed to his account and he's dying the death that all of us should have died. But the other side of that coin is you're still not righteous. You're just without sin. So the righteousness of Jesus, which is fulfilling all the requirements of the law, all of the requirements of the law, he's fulfilling in his life. And he does it perfectly. Remember God said, be perfect as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. We can't do that, but he did it. Jesus did it. And now that credit for that perfect perfection and holiness is, is now imputed to our account through the cross. Through faith. See how powerful faith is? It's amazing when the apostles ask Jesus, remember these are guys that have hundreds and hundreds of laws in their mind. Hundreds of laws in their mind. Okay? It's amazing. Even Jews today who keep Sabbath. I've heard of some of the crazy things they're doing to keep Sabbath. Or to skate around Sabbath. <laughs> because there's people that... If there's something on TV on Saturday they want to watch, they turn that channel on on Friday. So that way they don't have to touch the TV on Saturday, but they get to watch their show. Right? Okay? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you have been to Israel on the Sabbath? What do they do with the elevators there? Every button's hit all Sabbath long. So you gotta, if you've got to go to the 12th floor from the ground floor, it's going to take you a while. Because it's going to stop at every floor on the way down and open and close the doors because they make it that way so you can get it out of the elevator without touching a button. Okay? So they're, they were big-time law followers. So when the apostles asked Jesus, and they realized there's something different about Jesus, it prompts the question in their head, what are the works that we're to do for righteousness. Now, he could have said, read your Old Testament. You should know it from there. But they know something's different with Jesus. So they know to ask the question. And Jesus remarkably says, the work's for you to do. And you should be saying, wait a minute, there's no works for us to do. But Jesus says, no, the work's for you to do, he said, is to believe on the one that God has sent. Okay? It all comes down to belief. Hallelujah. Do you know what your life would be like if it wasn't for that? Okay? Your work is to believe on the one that God has sent. <clears throat> the gospel is the standard setter that allows us to know right from wrong. Without this standard, all things are permissible. Who in the world would have the right to tell somebody what they can or cannot do if it's not for God's existence? What one person ever on this earth would have any right to tell anybody else how to live their life if there's no God? Who would have that right? So sometimes when I teach this in class, I'll take a kid's cell phone. Hey, that's mine. Well, it was. Now it's mine. You can't do that. Says who? Uh, says my parents. Well, who are they? Well, they'll get it from... Well, tell them to come in and try to get it from me. Because they were... This is how I put it, and you're going to realize I probably should be fired. But this is the way that I put it. I say, your parents were born naked and crying and bleeding from the womb just like I was. So what gives them any right to tell me what's right or wrong? 
Well, the cops will back us up, but who are they? Why would I listen to them? Why would I listen to our governor or our president or any king? They all came into this world the way I did, so I don't see why they have any inherent rights over me. How about we decide this? I'll make all the rules and you all listen to those. It's just as random. If there's no moral authority over us, then nobody ever has the right to tell anybody what to do. In fact, Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky, said very simply, if God does not exist, then everything is permitted. Okay? So the gospel is that standard setter. Now, <clears throat> I want you to see, I'm going to read a couple verses right here out of 1 Timothy 1 and see if you can relate it to anything that I just mentioned a little while ago. Okay? Spruce up your ears. See if, you, see if this rings a bell in any way at all. He says, The law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. It's a little bit disguised. It'd probably be hard for you to pick up on. But what did I just mention a couple minutes ago? The Ten Commandments, right? Moses getting the law from Mount Sinai. Now listen to what Paul does here. First of all, who has the commandments? Who knows them by heart? Shame. Okay. What's the first one? Okay, know their gods before me. What's the second one? Is anybody Catholic in here? Because yours is different, you know. Okay, that's the third one. The second one's graven images. Right. Third one is, is uh, don't use the name of the Lord your God in vain. Fourth one, Sabbath day holy. Fifth, honor father, mother. Six, murder. It's not a prohibition against killing. God sometimes orders killing, right? Murder is unlawful killing. Seventh, <coughs> don't commit adultery. Eight, yeah, he doesn't forbid lying. He forbids false witness against your neighbor. Because remember, Rahab and the Hebrew midwives were greatly honored for lying because the Bible says they feared God and that led them, motivated them to lie, to spare life, right? And then the tenth, no, that was seven. Eight was lie. No. That's, that's ten. Nine is false witness against your neighbor. Eight is one that you've totally got me off track on right now. <laughs> All right, but anyways, this is what Paul seems to be doing. Okay, because I think he went one, two, three, four, seven, nine, eight, ten. Something like that. Okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, now, two tablets, right? How many were on the first tablet? Why is it divided four and six? Okay, because these all had to do with God. These all had to do man to man, right? So now let's, now let's look at his list again. He says, the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane. There's your first tablet, sins against God. Okay, now let's go to the second tablet. <clears throat> it says, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. Do you think that's such a large category? He needs to mention it. I think so many people kill mom and dad that he... No, so what's he probably doing here? He just did the first four commandments. He just did the first table with all those descriptions of the unholy and the profane and all that. And now he's hitting the second tablet. And what is the fifth commandment? Honor your mother and your father, right? What's the opposite of that? Killing them, right? So now he's hitting that one. He says, it's for those who violate the honoring mother and father, <coughs> murdering their fathers, murdering their mothers, and then is, at the next commandment is, thou shalt not murder, correct? And then it says, for manslayers. Okay, then it's don't commit adultery, right? 
And it says it's for fornicators and sodomites. And you go, well, that's not adultery. Well, these commandments are called, they're written in a form called synecdoche. Anybody familiar with that term? It means, it gives you a part, but it refers to the whole. Okay? <clears throat> it's like when you say, New York won the World Series. Well, the whole state didn't win the World Series. A, a group of baseball players that represent the whole won the World Series, right? But the way you state it is you state the whole state. You say New York won it, right? Okay? That's synecdoche. Okay? Part and whole. So when he says you should not commit adultery, that's, that's a prohibition against all sex outside the marriage covenant. Okay? So when the Bible says do not commit adultery, that is also for fornicators and sodomites. Now, what's the after do not commit adultery? What's the next command? Shall not steal. What's the next thing on Paul's lips? What is kidnapping? Stealing people, right? Stealing people. What's the next command? Don't bear false witness. It says this is for liars and for perjurers. <coughs> and then the 10th one is what? shall not covet. And Paul doesn't list that one here, which is interesting because that's the very one in Romans 7 that he says this. In Romans 7, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking the opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Now, what's unique about coveting compared to all the other sins? Okay, so it's, it's kind of like the, a sin of thoughts, right? Like lying you got to do or bearing false witness you got to do, murdering you got to do, all these things you got to do, right? Coveting is a want that leads to another want that leads to another want that you never, ever stop wanting, right? You never stop wanting. And then think of what Psalm 23, 1 says. David says, I shall not want. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. That's how you cure coveting, right? You receive the shepherding of the Lord and your coveting is gone. Why? Why? you're going to learn that the Lord is enough. doesn't matter what station of life you're in, the Lord is enough. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Verse 12. Well, verse 11, he says, any other things that is contrary to sound doctrine? 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. That's quite a thing for God to commit to anybody's trust is literally the gospel, the gospel of life for people to hear. Does that help you understand the importance of orthodoxy, sound doctrine, all of that, right? <clears throat> all right. Verse, tw uh, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. <clears throat> now, when you enter ministry, or I would say when you even enter into Christianity, for that matter, it always begins with thanksgiving, doesn't it? So thankfulness. You realize what's been done for you. Now, how can I get up here and tell you what the Bible says as a fellow sinner if I'm not willing to confess my sins, right? It would be very hypocritical for me to represent myself as somebody in a different category than everybody else, correct? Okay, that's what the hypocrite is, okay? So confession becomes crucial. Confession helps with humility, doesn't it? Okay? 
The difference between a humble person and a proud person is the humble person simply acknowledges their sin and the proud person ignores their sin. Okay? The only way I know to keep God on his throne in my life and where I don't try to nudge him out of his throne in my life is through confession, daily confession. I know who I am. I know how I think. I know where I stray. And I know that apart from him calling me into ministry, I have absolutely no business to stand up here in front of you. I have none. I think the least desirable person to hear the Bible from is a hypocrite, right? And the only way to avoid hypocrisy is to be willing to confess your sins. And no, that's not what I'm doing the rest of the class, okay? <laughs> but <clears throat> we are all a part of the priesthood of believers, correct? So we don't have to go to a confession booth and confess our sins to a priest, correct? Okay? It's what you have a closet for. It's what you have your bedroom for. Wherever you like to pray, you confess straight to Christ, correct? That keeps you from hypocrisy, from pretending that somehow um, you're better than everybody else. All right. <clears throat> That's what Paul does here. First, he's thankful. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who's enabled me. He's enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry and confession time. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. He says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. That's what unbelief ultimately is, is ignorance. Anything that falls short of knowing the truth is ignorance, right? Unbelief is ultimately ignorance. Paul said that he blasphemed and persecuted Christians ignorantly and in unbelief. It's like Jesus' prayer on the cross. Father, forgive them. Why? They're ignorant. They're acting ignorantly and in unbelief, right? Right? That's why you never give up on anybody. You never give up on anybody because look what Paul's saying here. I was a blasphemer. Why did, what gave Caiaphas the freedom to finally say, I've heard enough, go crucify this man? He said, you've heard his blasphemy yourself, right? You heard the blasphemy for yourselves. Because he said to Jesus, just tell us plainly, are you the Christ? He says, it is as you have just said. And then Caiaphas tears his robe and says, we have no more need of witnesses. You heard the blasphemy yourself. Which, by the way, who's he calling a blasphemer? What is blasphemy? It's directly sinning against God, claiming a place alongside God, right? And Caiaphas, the high priest, just accused God of claiming to be God, right? And he tears his robe. Now, if you refer back to the Hebrews series that I did some time ago now, I don't know how long ago it was, it's got to be years at this point, but the Melchizedek teaching in the book of Hebrews, where in Psalm 110, verse 4, God promises his son Jesus Christ way back in Old Testament times, he says, I have sworn and I will not change my mind. You, meaning Jesus, are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, right? So when did that order begin? Well, what was the other priesthood that was being eliminated? It's called the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron, the first high priest, Moses' brother Aaron. And every priest from Aaron to Caiaphas was a priest in the order of Aaron, well, when Caiaphas accuses Jesus Christ of blasphemy and tears his robe, the Aaronic priesthood is over. It's done. The Melchizedekian priesthood is now underway, which, by the way, is a priesthood forever, never to be changed. 
okay? And if you read Hebrews, you'll see Jesus doesn't have this issue with constantly dying and needing to be replaced, right? He lives forever, his priesthood goes on forever, and it's a better priesthood, and that's our high priest now. Um, <clears throat> We don't give up on people because Paul is saying, look who I was, but I obtained mercy. I want you to think of, <clears throat> in Luke 9, John and James get a nickname from Jesus. What nickname did Jesus give them? <laughs> Sons of Thunder. Why did he call them that? Because the Samaritans just insulted them. And they said, Jesus, you want us to call down fire from heaven and fry these Samaritans? Okay. Now, I want you to think of Acts chapter 8 for a moment. The same John who said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven? He's going to be renamed the apostle of love, by the way. Okay. And in Acts chapter 8, rumor had gone to the apostles that people in Samaria, those same Samaritans, had received the word of the Lord with joy. So John wanted to know, have they also received the Holy Spirit? And the way John words it is, I want to know if the Holy Spirit has come down upon them. Same guy that says, I want to rain fire down upon them. Now is checking up on them and says, I want to see if the Holy Spirit has come down upon them. He goes from, I want to fry them with fire from heaven to I want them saved by the Holy Spirit. That's why you don't give up on anybody. Okay. All right, verse 14. <clears throat> and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Remember when Jesus said, he who has been forgiven much loves much? It's what Paul's experiencing here. I was forgiven so much. I was forgiven so much. And he says, he's, gonna be, he's about to say, God did that for me because everybody should know that if he did it for me, he'd do it for anybody else. He did it to me, the chief of all sinners. Okay. He has been forgiven much, loves much. It always makes me think of Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb of Jesus because John and Peter come in and they're looking in the tomb and they're seeing what they're seeing and they leave. And then in John 20, verse 11, it says, but Mary. And that always hits me because you realize how much that woman's been forgiven. Seven demons. Church history charges her with harlotry. But that's church history. The Bible does not charge her with harlotry. The Bible says she was far more wicked than that. She was entirely satanic. Who knows the amounts of sin she piled up, possessed by seven demons? Jesus said it's the worst state of a person. And Mary Magdalene is a representative of that worst condition. And now she's the woman at the tomb who loves Jesus so much she can't leave the tomb. She stands there weeping. Because she's been forgiven so much. She loves him so much. Verse 15. So Paul's talking about, I was enabled to be put into the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. It's always that name. And then he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. This apparently was a, was a little epigraph that was being passed through church to church to church so that people would understand the basis for the setting up of the church. And here's the epigraph. He says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What does it say immediately after that? That's not part of the epigraph, though. <laughs> you can't have everybody saying of who I'm chief. I'm, there's one chief, Right? There's one chief. We're all Indian sinners. He's the chief, right? But why? So the quote is, the epigraph is, 
Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He says that's a reliable saying worthy of all acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul reflects upon his own life. He says, of who I am the chief. And I want you to notice it does not say of whom I was the chief. I used to be the chief. Now, why would he look at his life as a church planner, apostle, all of this, when everybody else is looking at him as the most holy guy we know? Paul looks in the mirror and says, I'm the chief of sinners. Why? Because the more mercy that you receive, the more you have the contrast to just how sinful we are and can be. If you don't have mercy in your life, you don't see how sinful you are. When you're given mercy, you start seeing clearly just how sinful you are. Think of Peter, great catch of fish that he gets, right? Why is the first thing out of his mouth, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Because he's really getting a glimpse that this is God. This is God. And now in the light of the revelation that this is God, I now see myself in that light clearly, and I have no merit to be in the presence of God right now. Okay? Just like I was saying, confession is so important because it keeps you humble. It's that humility that allows you to realize I'm in constant need of God's mercy because I'm constantly, in thought or deed or whatever, a sinner. God is giving us the Apostle Paul to, have, to, to show us all of these examples. If Paul can be a persecutor of Christians, responsible for their very executions, a blasphemer, and obtain mercy that there's nobody that's ever going to be able to say in the rest of church history, you don't know what I've done. God could never forgive me. Nobody can be too bad for the cross. Okay. So Paul is given to us as this example. The more we understand mercy, the more we understand our sin. And the more we understand our sin, the more we understand God's mercy. Rahab was like Paul in this, in, this, in this light. Rahab was like Paul because when we meet Rahab, she's a Canaanite who's to be killed by the Jews. She's a descendant of Ham who's under the curse of Noah as a Hamite. She's a harlot. Yet she displays a faith to the Jewish spies that enables them to enter into a covenant with her. Her faith overcame all of her impediments against being included in the family of God. Her faith canceled all that out, overcame the curses of being a Canaanite and a Hamite so that she could enter into the covenant of God. And by the way, Jesus Christ would call her one of his great-grandmothers. It's why we don't give up on people. <clears throat> Verse 16. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy. This is what he's saying, was what, I ju- what I just said. For this reason, I obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. He's saying... God gave me this mercy to show how long-suffering he can be, how much he had to put up with my nonsense, and how violent and, and, and blasphemous I was. It was to show everybody else who are going to believe on him for everlasting life that they are not excluded from grace and mercy. Now, what is unavoidable? What is unavoidable when you have these realizations? Paul's realizing, this is, you know, Paul's been a Christian for some time now. He understands grace and mercy. He's, he's been through this. He's been planning churches and all of this. But as soon as he starts giving his own testimony, 
starts with thankfulness and then it goes into the confession of who he was and then into the mercy of God, he can't help but to break out into doxology. He can't help but to praise God. Verse 17, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, with most people, you think, oh, they're done. Not Paul. This is still chapter one, right? <laughs> still chapter one. He just can't help but, but, but breaking out into doxology. Now, is he breaking out into doxology because he's got some fanciful idea of God that there's no basis in truth in? Or is he simply a reminding himself of who God actually is and that he can't help but start praising God. Listen, there's a way for you to know God that you can't help but breaking out into praise for him. That should always be your goal is to know him that way. You can't help but break out into praise when you realize who he is. That's what heaven is. <clears throat> All right. Verse 18. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy. Second time he calls him son in this chapter. According to the prophecies previously made concerning you. Apparently when they laid hands on him for ministry, um, people prophesied over him. And he's saying some of that's coming to fruition here. Now this charge that he's giving, that he's committing to him, I think people differ on this. Some think it's the charge that he just gave um, about Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and that's the charge for the church, is to be teaching that. Um, some think it's the middle of the book, chapter 3, that I gave you, that the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. I think it's all of chapter 2 and 3. Okay, The charge is going to be, here's how you set up, here's how the church has got to be. Here's the doctrine of the church, here's the leadership of the true church, follow this. This is the charge, okay? If I ever became a church planter, these would be the chapters I'd be hanging on my walls of my office. Chapters 2 and 3 of 1 Timothy, among others, but these in particular. So I think it's chapter 2 and 3, right or wrong, that's what I think that is. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. You see a definition of church there? It's a warrior. It's got to fight warfare. It's what a church does. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected. Now, we're always going to get into the obstacles. It's like, hey, we're setting up church. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's how the leadership's going to be. Here's how everything's going to be. And then he goes, but here's the obstacles. Why? Because we don't battle flesh and blood. The church is battling principalities and powers of darkness in higher places all the time. It's never not a battle. Okay? That's why if there's social media battles going on about churches, we just, as Christians, we don't have time for all that. We got the principalities and powers of darkness and higher places to worry about. Right? Which some have rejected concerning the faith. They've suffered shipwreck of whom are Hymenaeus. Imagine you're in the eternal scriptures as a negative person in the church. This is Hymenaeus. Hymenaeus you can read more about in 2 Timothy 2.17. Paul has bad things to say about Hymenaeus there. And Alexander, Hymenaeus and Alexander. I think this Alexander is the Alexander he mentions in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which is, he's a coppersmith, and he simply says this in 14 and 15, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Thank God that's not my name. The Apostle Paul is putting in the scriptures as, I hope the Lord goes and gets him, man. <laughs> so these are the obstacles. There's people in the church that become obstacles. It's Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now we see Paul in Corinthians, he also delivers somebody over to Satan for the burning of his flesh. And then in 2 Corinthians, he's told, he tells that same church, welcome him back in. Why? His flesh was burned. 
He got turned over to Satan. He realizes it's not where I want to be. It's not how I want to be. I repent. So the turning over to Satan doesn't mean you're damning somebody to hell. It means I want you to own the consequences of your decisions, and we're going to have to treat you as an unbeliever, and you're going to have to live the life of an unbeliever to back up your behavior, and that ought to be enough to have you repent. We don't do a good job in this country of church discipline. But church discipline is designed to hand people over to Satan for the burning of their flesh so that they repent and they come back again. Okay, to not discipline people, according to Hebrews 12, is to not love them well. It's to not love them well. All right, so we'll finish on that negative note. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, it's your word. I pray this was faithful to you, Lord God. And, and I pray, Lord, that you would do an amazing work in all of our hearts through it because... Every time we meet with you through your word, Lord, we want to be changed. We want to be different. We want to be more conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, our great hope. And in his name we pray, amen.